Songwriting is the greatest joy that I have in my life. It's the favorite, my favorite element of what I do. Taking it in and being grateful every day for the fact that I get to write songs for a living because a lot of people write songs and it doesn't get to be what keeps their lights on. And for me, to be able to be one of those people, I never forget how lucky I am. With anything, you know, distance makes the heart go fonder. So having that distance from my fans for the longest I've ever had since I was 12 years old, having almost two years separated from me and my audience, the, the pandemic kind of reunited and, and just lit that, that spark again for me for the gratitude that I have for being able to be a live musician first. I think I've had, in a way, this amazing gift that my audience grew up with me. It's very different than the relationship that I have with the public or the press or the media or their perception of me, but it's really stayed grounded in the really unique relationship that I have with my fans and with my audience, because a lot of us were the same age. The people that watched my show were my same age. I'm very passionate about a lot of things, especially different forms of creativity and artistry. I never sign or say I'll collaborate with someone that I don't have the capacity to actually give them what they deserve, which is my full focus, my attention and my ideas. And when I'm depleted, I don't have as good of ideas. Right now, a focus of mine is my collaboration that I have with Gucci. It was just very natural for me. I, I respect Gucci as a brand. I love what they're doing philanthropically. We actually shared a lot of the same team members uh, from Happy Hippie and Gucci without even knowing we were ever gonna partner up. So we already, we align on our values and our morals and then also making beautiful clothes. Happy Hippie is my purpose. I think the activism and artistry, they're really one. I think artists come with a message. And my message was justice, equality, celebration of individuality. And it's been a beautiful evolution, not just to watch, but as, you know, the founder of Happy Hippie to see how much process we've had in the last five years, not just Happy Hippie, but it kind of seems globally that the conversation of love, acceptance, justice, equality, that is the topic right now. And it's just really beautiful to be alive and experience this new kind of revolutionary time that we're all living in. It feels like there's a nice shift happening where people may not completely change their mind, but their mind is open. And that's really the way that you can get in there with your own message. I feel like my entire life I've struggled a bit with being the loudest person in the room, standing up for yourself. So I think this whole experience, getting to be an executive producer, it's helped me a lot with that. My name is Miranda Cosgrove. I'm an actress and I'm also the executive producer of my show iCarly. When it came about that we were maybe gonna do a revival of iCarly, the show I did when I was little, and they said that I could be an executive producer on it, I was super excited about it. Because when I did the original iCarly, I didn't have any creative control. So I just thought, this is gonna be a whole different experience, and it was something that really excited me. At first I was a little scared, because I was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be so much work, I'm gonna be doing so many things that I've never done before and how, am I going to do a good job? I think parts of it, I, I knew how it worked from doing it when I was young, but a lot of it I just had to kind of learn on the fly and it's just been such a rewarding experience. With this new version of iCarly, there's a little girl on the show named Jaden and I totally see myself in her. Like when she's on set, she takes all the notes and is trying her best to just do what everybody is looking for, all these adults are looking for. But because I know how that feels, I, I feel like I try really hard to make sure her voice is heard. Even though she's a kid, she still is an artist and she's still a comedian and she's a huge part of what the character ends up looking like in the show. 
Young people do come up to me sometimes and they'll be like, I wanna act and how did you get into it and how should I do it? And I always tell them like, you gotta do what actually feels good to you. Like you gotta be yourself. You can't change yourself to try to get a part or something. Like you have to be you and you have to feel good about it. And I think that took me a while to learn just cause when you start auditioning at a really young age and you're pretending to be all these different characters and you're trying to get parts and things, it can kind of make it hard to figure out exactly who you are. So yeah, I'd say just always like follow your instincts, your gut instincts, and really listen to your heart. Even though that does sound cheesy, it's totally true. If you think about what it would normally take to start a business, you've got to rent some real estate on Main Street, and then you've got to invest in buying a whole bunch of inventory and stocking the shelves. And let's say you can create a listing for 20 cents. If it sells, make that product and then invest more and more in making more products. And that way you get to learn what types of products your customers are interested in, how to price it. And the cost of entry is, is so low. My name is Josh Silverman. I'm the CEO of Etsy, and we're here in Brooklyn at the Etsy headquarters. I started as an entrepreneur and was a, a co-founder and CEO of Evite back in the late 1990s. But for the past 20 years, I've had the privilege to work for companies that had a very successful first act where I've come to help and unlock a really successful second act. So for example, I was the CEO of Skype at a time when Skype was about free phone calls. And my team and I pivoted Skype to be about video calling to being about being together when you can't be in the same room. And that unlocked a, a major new chapter for Skype. Etsy's always had the best of intentions. It's always believed that we can be both a great corporate citizen and a great business. I think where we've made a lot of progress in the past five years is connecting those intentions with outcomes. So as a culture, we have really embraced accountability. We're very data-driven and we really believe in focus. We pick a few things at a time. We obsess over delighting our customers. And then we're willing to take bold bets to make sure that the customer experience in Etsy is really world-class. And I'm incredibly proud of how the team has risen to that challenge and really delivered a world-class experience to both our buyers and our sellers. I'm incredibly proud of how this marketplace now serves well over 5 million sellers who report that two-thirds of them actually had more sales in 2020 than they did in 2019. So when you think about how much economic hardship the pandemic has wrought, Etsy has really been a haven. It's really been a source of economic power for literally millions of people around the world who might be displaced through automation, who might be displaced through the pandemic and are turning to Etsy and finding that we can provide an economic opportunity for them. In fact, there's almost $3 billion per quarter being bought and sold on Etsy right now. We all woke up and in a single day, we saw that sales on Etsy were exploding. It was in early April, 2020. And when we looked closely, we discovered that it was all the sale of masks, fabric face masks. The, the Centers for Disease Control had changed its recommendation to now recommend that people do wear masks. And all of a sudden we saw an explosion of demand for masks. And we decided that this would be a moment when Etsy could really step into the void. And so we told the team to drop everything and make the mask buying experience on Etsy great. And within a week, we stood up a mini company, if you will, designed just to get people to make and sell masks and to buy masks. And we were able to mobilize tens of thousands of sellers within just a matter of a week or two to come and start listing and selling masks on Etsy. And that provided buyers with an opportunity to buy masks that were not PPE, so they weren't taking masks that frontline workers needed or hospital workers needed, to get those masks shipped to them quickly and cheaply, but also to buy masks that have a sense of style that represent their personality. And that got, we think, a lot of people more comfortable buying masks and wearing masks. So we're really proud of the role that the Etsy marketplace could play in, in, at a time when people needed us. I believe that the mission of Etsy is so important and I believe that we play a unique and powerful role in the lives of over 5 million sellers and almost 100 million buyers. I think that if Etsy weren't here, it would leave a massive gap in the lives of millions of people. And that's incredibly special and I think there's a ton of responsibility that comes with that. But I think everyone, everyone who works for Etsy feels both the power of that purpose and, and also the responsibility of the mission. When you read 110 to 115,000 comic books, a lot of it sticks and then some of it, you know, someone will ask me a question and I was like, boy, I know I read that and I have 
very little recollection of it, which tells me that it was kind of a middle-of-the-road comic. I'm Bob Bretall, and I collect comic books and related ephemera. I have somewhere north of 120,000 at this point. That's not the number in the record book, but I'm working on transferring my stuff to a new debate database and I'll be updating my Guinness number um, hopefully by the end of the year. From the moment that I started reading them when I was eight years old, it just I got sucked into that world and it was just, you know, kind of a connect the dots of all these different things where I went from one thing to another, but I just kept reading them and I read them to this day. There are collectors out there and, you know, they have a very limited definition of comics or they really haven't bothered looking around at what's available because there are a tremendous number of good comics have been published throughout the whole time I've been reading them. I try to make stuff kind of logically fit together. I kind of made an art gallery out of this stuff. These are all original art pages. A lot of art today is done digitally but back in the day, they would do it black and white on these 11 by 14 art boards. And the lettering would be right on it. And then they would reproduce that um, and reduce it. And then they would do coloring guides um, off of that. So I've collected art over the years. I have two older brothers and they're quite a bit older than me, like eight and 10 years older than me. So there were always comics around when I was little. I remember reading some Uncle Scrooge comics or Richie Rich or there'd be a Batman or some other kind of superhero comics. When I was eight, my brother, my older brother Russ, gave me a coupon that he made, you know, just that was good for 10 comic books because I had kind of liked to read his comics and I think he wanted me to stay away from his comics. So he's like, if you go to the store and buy a comic book and come back and show it to me, I'll mark one of the slots on the coupon off and give you the 15 cents back. They cost 15 cents then. When I was a little kid, <laughs> entertainment options were very limited for me as an eight-year-old. I would cut the characters out of my comic books to make little paper dolls and I would have adventures and Spider-Man would fight Daredevil and I would do all kinds of fun things with them and of course I destroyed a lot of my, my earliest comics by cutting the characters out of my comic books. Um, this is a Spider-Man that I cut out of some early issue of Spider-Man that I had when I was probably eight or nine years old. I had collected over the years all the issues of Spider-Man, but I didn't have his first appearance, which was an amazing Fantasy 15, and which was always a fairly expensive comic. Around the time I got the record, I decided I was gonna buy Amazing Fantasy 15. Over the last 51 years, I've bought every comic book that I have pretty much, indi well, not individually, because I get like, <laughs> 30 or 40 comic new comics a week. So I'm still buying lots of comics, but I buy all these comics myself. I buy them kind of one at a time and I read them all. If you've never read a comic and you think that comics are only superheroes, they're not. And you know, if you're interested at all in the medium and not everybody is, but just that the combination of art and story, I just love it. And some people that's gonna click with and other people it won't, but it's really worth trying out a comic book and it doesn't have to be a superhero comic book. You can go to a comic book store and get all different kinds of things. And there's you know, so many different kinds of comics and just see if it's entertaining. The sacrifices you make when you're creating a brand any creator can relate. It's lonely, it can be frightening, you can be scared. I'm so proud of myself for believing in something that I worked so hard to create. It's incredible. My name is Alexandra Cooper. I go by Alex, but Alexandra because this is Forbes. I am 27 and I have a podcast called Call Her Daddy. Call Her Daddy essentially is 
a podcast, but also just a brand and a lifestyle that embodies what maybe you would talk about with your friends in your bedroom, but maybe too embarrassed to talk about in public or tweet about. There's so much shame around so many topics and themes that I was fortunate to grow up in a household that was normalized to speak your mind. And so I was like, give me the microphone, I'll say it. My dad is in the industry, he does sports production, and there was always cameras in my house, and I would pick it up and point it at my face and be like, I need to be on camera, I need to be making movies. And then after college, I heard out, like, I'm like, oh my God, what's a podcast? Started a podcast, and I always knew I was gonna be in the creative space in some form, and it just happened to be that podcast started to get big, and that's where I landed. I think probably the entire business industry has been really exciting to learn, but also nerve wracking. Like I didn't go to business school. So I'm sitting here and I know how to be a creative, but on the other side, you have to learn how to manage your business. Also social media never turns off. And I think that's something that creators are probably really struggling with managing. How do I put it down and detach for a minute? So I think I've also learned like, more sometimes is shutting off for a minute because then I'm gonna come back more refreshed and I'll actually be giving them quality over quantity. Spotify is one of the biggest in the audio space. I'm not gonna sit here and be like, yeah, you know, it's cool. Like this is insane that I signed this deal. I think for Call Her Daddy, the goal is to continue to grow and maybe like a TV show, a book, a movie, a tour, a Christmas album, and then I'll retire at 80. I don't think I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was inspired um, on a trip to Japan. I was fascinated by the kimono and also, you know, just the general Japanese aesthetic. So I started to imagine this kind of idea around simple clothing. I felt a little jealous of men who could just easily, you know, get dressed and, you know, if they wanted to look professional, they had a kind of a uniform. I wanted to do something that was simple and that was timeless. I loved textiles, I loved fabric. And so I started seeing these pictures and uh, I imagined these simple clothes and how they worked and pictures just kept coming to me. And, you know, I just started talking up the idea to friends and uh, I found myself at the boutique show and I was, I remember floating through and going like, oh, I could do this. When I decided to start the business, I remember thinking, what? you're crazy, you don't have any money, you can't afford to do this. And I remember looking at my bank account and going like, $350, that's it, that's all you have. What are you doing, you know? But that's what it cost me to to sign up for the first boutique show. I just did, took one little uh, wall in the back of the boutique show and I shared a booth with two other people. And that's sort of how I launched. I think that, that being over 50, the way I find myself describing it is I feel like I'm like on a spiral and I keep kind of repeating the same mistakes but I'm just coming a little higher. I'm like, so I'm, I see them, I have a little more perspective. I see them from a little higher place so I can, I can uh, fix them quicker or you know, uh, I can be a little more aware of what's happening or what might work or what might not work. I can catch certain things because I have a little different perspective. I think that's personal too. In my own life, I see myself, oh, yeah, hmm, that's the same thing I did before. Okay, okay, this time, this time I caught it a little quicker. This time I spoke up sooner. This time, you know, I, I actually made a change. I never thought about giving up. I thought it might give me up. You know, it might, it might fail. There were several times al along the way, it, including during COVID that I thought, we might not do this, we might not make it. So um, that was disturbing, devastating, and um, also I'm a problem solver, you know, so like when things go wrong, I like dive in. It's kind of like with sustainability, it's like, okay, here's a problem, let's try to fix it, you know. And even though, you know, that's a kind of a strange attitude in life, try to fix problems, but I kind of see problems as opportunities or possibilities or, 
you know, something's wrong. Piles of clothes that are piling up from our recycle program. What are we going to do? Oh, there must be a creative solution somewhere. You know, life is long and, and like I said, you know, it's just, you know, it kind of keep going. You have so many, we have so many opportunities when it comes to work you know, to invent and reinvent ourselves and to do amazing things at all ages. In 1980, I came to United States pursuing my master's degree. In 1982, I started selling $5 digital watch in the flea market. If I make $20 a day, I was happy because $20 to me is I have a food and gas money. I met my wife in Flushing. We both working very hard day and night and selling gold jewelry in the flea market. We opened our first jewelry and watch store on Long Island. But I have a vision. My vision is Flushing. Flushing is largest Chinese community in the East Coast. Chinese are very loyal neighboring. And they are spending, buying luxury goods. So 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to open a large scale jewelry store on, on the downtown. Flushing. Today I'm very proud of my three children. They are running the day-to-day -day business. Growing up, I saw how hard like my parents worked and I saw how much like their business meant to them and how much they put into it that it made me want to like help them out. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon University and the business was really starting to pick up to where it is today, so I joined at that time to help out, and I never really left after that. It's been really a blessing in disguise to work with my family, just because you develop these really raw and honest relationships that you mostly won't develop if you weren't working with your family. I remember one day I was driving to work, and I get a call from my dad. He's like, hey, you know, Derek, um, would you consider like coming back home to New York because I was in Florida at the time and uh, I was like okay like what's going on and he was like oh you know your mom Lisa she just got cancer I remember like pulling over and I, I was like crying in my car and then I just emailed my boss right away like hey I got a family emergency I gotta head home I stayed home with my mom to help take care of her and unfortunately in December of 2015 she passed away from a rare cancer I got to see like through her life, like how much energy and work she put into the business with my dad. And if I don't come into the business, it would have been for nothing. Like I, I can't let that happen because, you know, my mom's not asking me, but I should do it because it's the right thing now. So definitely there's a generational gap. I mean, we always butt heads like almost every day. I feel like you have your moments where you fight and you're just, but like when you fight, it's different from fighting with your coworkers or something. It's just more like it's your family. But then maybe 10, 10 minutes later, you're like, you forgive each other and you're like, okay, I'm calm. I, I understand what you're saying. You know, we always joke with my dad. He's like, you know, when I was your age, I used to do everything in the store. And we're always like, yeah, but dad, now we're like doing everything you did, plus we have the speed of the internet of people reaching out to us, contacting us, everything is like much faster. Yeah, I think he's definitely more open to new ideas now. Um, I think the goal for us is to just do it, and if it succeeds, then he's open to it, and if it doesn't succeed, then we try something else. New video tonight. Showing the moment a man shoved a 52-year-old woman to the ground outside a bakery in Queens, causing her to hit her head so hard she needed at least a half dozen stitches. We are Chinese, but we are also American. And we work here, we work hard, we pay taxes, we are American. It's definitely been really terrifying to see um, all the crimes that's on the news and it's really heartbreaking to see the attacks, especially on the elderly. If I ride the train, I'm really worried. And I also think not just for 
other people, but like if something happens to someone, am I prepared to jump in? We see celebrities, like we see Daniel Day Kim and Olivia Munn, they're coming together and talking about Stop Asian Hate. They have huge voices and I think that not just from them, but also from our local community, like stores like us, we need to speak up. We've been here for a long time and we're part of the history of this country and that what we bring is pretty much our culture and our food and you know all the good things that everyone loves to experience and we just want to get back to that time. Especially as an Asian American, you don't really see many Asian American jewelry stores that actually get passed down to generations. So um, that's something I definitely want for our family and for this community. And also, like there's been so many restaurants been uh, coming up, and like a lot of people have been discovering like Flushing and Flushing growing bigger as a community. So it's been great to see that, and I think that our store has definitely helped make that impact to make all the changes, the new changes that are coming in. This is my American dream. I want to be successful, and I want my uh, children continuing running the business, make Carrot and Co more powerful and make a customer happy, that's our goal. I don't think I've ever told him, but my goal for him is I want him to live comfortably and not worry about work or anything and just let us take all the stress and worries. You know, he works so hard and he deserves to just enjoy his life. I'm about to be the biggest. Just... Go watch this interview. People are gonna look back at this moment when I answer this question, they're like, damn, he wasn't lying. My name is Jack Harlow. I'm a recording artist. I'm 23. My parents didn't let me and my brother play on electronics when we were kids. So I say that to say I spent all of my formative years reading. And in class, I liked English, writing, personal narratives, all that. But you, I became 10, 11, 12, and I started to hear the music that everyone was listening to. And, you know, they're just not saying hip hop's the dominant genre, but it's honestly been that way a while for the youth. So it's just something about the the rhythmic side of it that was just so attractive to me. Just, And I think that combined with being a writer, storytelling, just class, and I was just like, this is what I want to do. I think probably the down moments probably impacted me the most. And when I say down moments, I mean having to do shows with 12 people in the room. It's basically all the moments of selling yourself, begging people to rock with you. Especially in my genre, it's so much about bravado and saying, I'm the man. And sometimes early on, I was making that music saying, I'm the man. And then I go to the show and you find out you're not yet. And I think it really improved my performance, my confidence to struggle through getting embarrassed, basically. If there was a new artist, you know, I would just encourage them to really try and tell the truth in their music. It goes a long way to just be vulnerable and speak from the heart. I think that's what keeps you here. If you look at all the artists that have been here for a decade or longer and haven't just gone to the wayside, they're all truth tellers and they all speak from here. And it doesn't mean don't make the party music. You gotta make some of that too. But at some point, people have to sit down and feel like, I know who that is. Shonda Rhimes is one of four covers on the 50 over 50 inclusive capital issue. And it's four female covers, which is super exciting for Forbes. She is the only woman from Hollywood to, to get a cover. And I think that's important and iconic, especially because she's a black woman in Hollywood. And Hollywood not only has over the last few years been reckoning with a Me Too problem in terms of gender discrimination or sexual harassment and assault and kind of how difficult it is for women to really succeed sometimes. Shonda Rhimes might be a surprising fit for the 50 over 50 list because a lot of her biggest hits came out before she turned 50. Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder. But uh, the reason she's on the list is really because at 51, she's entered a new phase in her career with the Netflix deal she made a few years ago and with Bridgerton being this international mega hit for Netflix. When Shonda was at ABC, she was basically the queen of the network to the outside world, right? She was commanding Thursday night. She was getting the most viewers. She There were a ton of headlines saying how she was saving broadcast TV. 
But behind the scenes, there was always a negotiation. By the end, she was getting paid a lot, you know, $250,000 an episode for Grey's Anatomy. At the same time, you know, she always had to kind of fight to prove her value to, to ABC and to Disney. And that's even after she brought in $2 billion uh, to the Disney empire. Around 2017, she started to realize I'm one of the best storytellers in television right now. I'm one of the most valuable showrunners. Why am I fighting to, to get paid what I deserve or to get the creative freedom I deserve? And she started to meet with Netflix, with Ted Sarandos. At that point, she realized where she could get paid a ton of money up front, but more than just the money, she could get creative freedom, flexibility. She can make the kinds of shows she wanted to make. And she's really embraced that as ever since. Um, and we saw that with Bridgerton, which was the first show of her Netflix deal to come out. And it became, within a few weeks, uh, Netflix's number one show ever. In the first 28 days, 82 million households, or 40% of Netflix's paying audience, watched the eight-episode series uh, Bridgerton. That smashed previous viewing records. A second season was buffed within weeks. In April, Netflix renewed for seasons three and four, and there's also a spinoff in the works uh, based around her character, Queen Charlotte. So Shonda, who is already making $30 million a year to create exclusive content for the streamer, is expected to receive millions in bonus pay because of the series success. Shonda Rhimes was the first person to sign an overall deal with a streaming service. Um, and that was a really big deal back in 2017 when it happened. At Netflix, she earned the most money in 2021 than, than she's earned in her whole career. She'll earn close to $70 million this year, we estimate. Close to 40 million of that is coming from Netflix. And then she still obviously is making Grey's Anatomy and Station 19. And she also gets eight figures in her share of Grey's Anatomy scandal and how to get away with murder profits. Since her television career began in 2005, she's earned more than $350 million pre-tax, making her one of the biggest showrunners uh, in terms of earnings in Hollywood history. She knows what she deserves and she's clear about what she deserves. She's this huge overarching figure. And so it's, it's really cool to see that here's this 51 year old woman in Hollywood and she's still just getting started. And there's so much more of her career left, um, especially when it comes to an industry that really idolizes youth a lot. She is building the kind of company that, that Hollywood needs more of, you know, a lot of women. Um, it's extremely inclusive of every kind of race and every gender. And, and that's just so important um, that, you know, she's not only putting people of color in her shows, she's actually building this empire, this company that is inclusive on, on all the rungs of the ladder. If she continues being as successful as she is, she will be the highest paid showrunner in television. And I think it's just a real lesson on betting on yourself and betting on your abilities to succeed. So how I have learned about IFF is kind of a funny story because I was working for 25 years in the pharmaceutical industry and then um, somebody reached out to me whether I want to be an independent director on IFF sport. But I had no idea what this company is. I had not even an idea what the industry is. But then I learned so much and it convinced me that this is a real fun industry. An industry where you get uh, art and science combined. And that's really, really something which attracted me uh, to be on the board of IFF and then later become CEO and chairman. IFF may not be a company you've heard of, but you've almost certainly used one of their clients' products. We went to the headquarters in New York City to see just exactly how these products are made, and it was pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, look, we just do 20% of our business in the U.S. and the rest is international. So we have basically most of our employees somewhere. Asia, probably 20-25%, Europe, probably 30%, 35%, and then Latin America and, and, and North America. Look, if you ask me how you get exposed to some of the IFF technologies or products and you go into a supermarket or in a duty-free shop, I would guess in, in one of five or one of six products, there's certainly an IFF technology. It could be a plant-based burger, which is entirely made of IFF uh, ingredients and te technologies. It could be a fragrance you wear, which is a complete IFF uh, creation where we have invented the molecules, where we have done the creation with our perfumers and we have manufactured it. So all of that could be exposed to you as a consumer.
Andrew Sivig was running Bayer's $12 billion pharmaceutical business for a really long time. He's taken that kind of pharma CEO energy to IFF, engineered a bunch of really big mergers, including a $26 billion merger with DuPont's nutrition business, which is why now IFF has one of the clearest and strongest platforms to be developing plant-based protein. We think just broader than uh, flavors and fragrances. We think about total solutions. We think about innovative and very creative spaces to go, like the whole uh, plant-based meat space, where we believe it, it's good for sustainability, it's, it's good for health, we want it to be a player there. And they have a couple of other areas, in particular in the biotech field, which were very, very attractive for IFF. So what we have here is a, is a robot which is basically mixing all these uh, creations uh, to make sure that uh, our customers get, uh, get the first tests already. Yeah, this is a robot which is doing it all on, it, on its own so you don't need any people. You just put the formula in and it's mixing it automatically. The most fun for me is, is basically talking to our researchers, talking to our creators about new products. What can we do? What can we invent? And what can we bring to our customers and to the consumers? That's a, that's a big fun part. And I can tell you, we have a lot of very, very creative and very knowledgeable employees. And I think we have a very good atmosphere in the company as well. There are a lot of formulas and, and, and a lot of uh, things which we test out with consumers and with our customers, customers as well. Here everything is, is data and facts. And I would say that's something which is very important to me as well. And, and that might be important about IFF is that we are a company where research and development plays an important role. So we have always a very data-driven driven approach. The whole aspect of sustainability or ESG is much, much more important these days. And I'm so happy that we started already seven or eight years ago to put a real focus uh, be, be behind that. For IFF, it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, we have brought the company from around about 2.9 billion in sales to, to 11.5 billion in sales. And certainly the market cap has, has increased uh, quite significantly as well. With that, a lot of changes have happened in, in, in the company, but I believe for the better, because the company is now very well positioned to be very successful for the next, next decade, because we have literally all the ingredients to be successful. I always had a grind, so I just saw opportunities as they came up to further myself, and I took every opportunity that I could get. My name's Cole Mason. I'm the CEO of Pear Pop. I'm 25 years old. I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit since I was little, from selling handmade crosses door to door to being a failed YouTuber, trying to grow myself through that. It didn't work out, I got like 10 views a video. But then, post that, I then got signed by Ford Models, so I moved out. And going to castings, the first thing that they would ask for is followers next to your name. So through that, I had to go through the social media grind again and go through everything to figure out how to grow myself. After that, I started promoting in nightlife. So with promoting, I was able to meet so many influencers and I realized that there was a huge discrepancy in pay for creators. It was so crazy to me to think like, some of these guys were pulling in more views than a TV show, but they weren't getting paid for it. So what I wanted to do was create Parapop just through basically my experiences and what I had gone through on growing myself. Parapop, the, the mission of it is we're moving from platform-driven awareness to people-driven influence we were able to get now 85,000 creators, where now the creators aren't gonna have to go and post for free anymore. Right now, they have to go on, log in and say, pick a sound, pick a creative to use, so why go do that and let the platform make the money when you can go with us and then get paid for your views on across all social platforms. Persistence is everything. When you're first starting, it feels, I guess, like the whole world is against you, right? You go up against every problem you could imagine. But persistence is key. If the drive is there, you'll see the opportunities in everything. And you just take those opportunities as they come and eventually things pan out.
the benefit and actually the beauty of having a public failure, at least for me, it took away any fear of failure. Because you fast forward 10 years later and I'm stronger as a person, I've already failed publicly, I lived through it, it was horrible at the time, and all that did was just allow me to move forward at a very fast pace and create an amazing company. The Real Real is the world's largest marketplace for authenticated luxury resale. When I was growing up, both of my parents, mostly because they're artists, really loved beautiful things and that didn't necessarily mean beautiful new things. So my mother would go to people's homes and if they had a nice rug, she'd say, when you're ready to sell it, I'll buy it from you. And my father and I would go to the junkyard to scavenger for beautiful pieces, which he would then refurbish and, and turn into something else. At the moment in time, when I shut the company down to return money to shareholders, I was thinking about my employees and making sure they had a pay package and future jobs. And also, my husband had asked me for a divorce that day, so there was a lot going on. And I would say six months later, it really hit me that this was really bad for my career. It didn't help that every major newspaper and every tech article was written not about the company and not about the Times but also about me personally, and um, pretty, pretty horrible things. I was called the dumbest person in Silicon Valley, and so it was, it was a hard time. After Pets, even though it had a lot of um, negative press, I didn't really realize how much of it would sort of stick to me um, and how my options may be limited after that until I met with a recruiter. And he said, basically, after, he said, well, Pets.com was such a blow up, your career's over. And, you know, I wouldn't show you to any company, I wouldn't introduce you to any companies. But hearing that made me go, okay, well, what am I gonna do about it? You know, and uh, clearly, I'm not gonna be able to get my dream job from someone else, and I'm gonna have to create my own. That's exactly how it, that hit me. Not like, oh, he's wrong or he's a jerk. It was like, okay, I'm taking this as valid. How, what does that mean for me? It means that I should start my own company because I'm, other people don't believe in me right now in the Valley, it's small world, but I believe in myself, so that's my best option. With The Real Real, our biggest accomplishment is bringing awareness to the amount of fashion in landfill and the incredible benefits of buying and consigning previously owned goods. We're doing it on everything we do on our website. We're doing it on our own company. We're now carbon neutral. And even more importantly, we're working with our congressmen and multiple people in the government to help change laws, to actually increase the awareness of the importance of recirculating used goods and conscious consumption. And if we make any dent on that, given the environmental situation the world's in, I'm gonna feel like, um, I'm gonna feel pretty good about what I've done and what the company's done. I would say that you need to think of your career as a long-term investment. I would encourage you to take risks, never stop taking risks. And even when you think you're there, you're not there yet. That learning happens at every age and you're gonna have, set, you will have setbacks. You know, figure it out, don't give up. Um, this is the long game, don't play the short game. And more importantly, you have to love what you do. And you also have to be conscious of the choices you're making. So if you become an entrepreneur, and I'd love to see more female entrepreneurs, recognize that that will consume your life. So be conscious about it. Is that really the track I wanna go? Or do I wanna balance my home life with job for a while and then I can do it later? The other thing is, you know, really, the real real I started at 53, so clearly it's never too late. But I had a lot of great experience to build on. So, you know, life, life can be long. And also take care of your body and your mind. And you know, you have to eat right, you have to exercise, you have to give yourself a spiritual, spiritual nourishment. So take care of yourself along the way. 
The first time I seen a basketball, I think it was out the womb. I have baby pictures holding a basketball. It's something that's been a part of my life for my whole life. Through my generations, it's kind of been passed down, starting with my grandpa. You know, he played semi-pro, and then my father had a career a short time in the NBA, but mostly overseas. And I had a chance to visit him out there and see his lifestyle and playing basketball and see how much the ball did for him and, you know, the different places it took him in the world and how it changed his life. And, you know, my ultimate dream was to be in the NBA. It was kind of like a stepped process to where initially I wanted to be on the varsity basketball team. Then it moved to I wanted to play in college for free, get a free education. And then once I was in college, that's when I was like, I want to make this my lifestyle and make it my life. I sacrificed a lot of childhood, you know, a lot of hard work goes into it. I moved a lot, I traveled a lot, you know, and I was away from my family and friends for a lot of time all in pursuit to get to where I'm at now and, you know, still a long way to go. I just want to continue to grow in all aspects of life and set myself up for after basketball. I'm actually a part owner in a beverage right now called Coco Five. I'm three years into my charity and my foundation. It's called the Devin Booker Starting Five. And Book Projects is my creative brand studio some advice that Kobe left me with is be legendary. You know, that, that's what it's about, legacy and inspiring. I think that's the biggest thing you can do is inspire the next generations. And, you know, that's not always making a money commitment. You know, it's the way you carry yourself also. So, you know, just understanding that, you know, it's bigger than you. And, you know, there's a lot of people watching you when you're on this stage and you're in this position. My name is Rita Boncompagni de Lovisi. Um, I was married to the late Niccolo Boncompagni de Lovisi, 12th Prince of Piombino, and uh, he was the head of the family. And this is, was our home, or is our home, and uh, I've lived here for uh, almost 20 years. This building was built in 1570. The first owner was Cardinal Francesco de Monte. And when you come into the Ingresso, you will see the ceiling was done by the leading Mannerist painter in 1570, Zuccheri. And although it celebrates the, um, the good works of Cardinal Francesco Nero, uh, as you go around it, in the center, uh, there is a um, face of the grotesque. And as you, you turn, as you're looking at it, and the face follows you everywhere it goes, and the eyes change color. They go from brown to blue. Um, and then there's a baldacchino in the ingresso. Only families that descend from popes have the baldacchinos. So it's full of history. It's about 30,000 square feet, but it's two acres of land in the middle of Rome. You're in the landscape room, which was featured at the Grand Palais in Paris and also at the Prada Museum in Madrid in 2010. There's a fresco by Guccino, Brio, Viola, Domenichino, the center Pomerancho, and they said that this is the finest representation of 17th century landscape art in the world. The home and the property is what's left of what was once more than an 85-acre garden in the center of Rome. It was the biggest garden of its kind in Rome. The property was later redeveloped into separate plots along what today is Via Veneto, which is one of the most glamorous shopping districts in the world. And the district that it's located in is called Ludovisi. It's still named after uh, Princess's husband's family. The home will need more than $10 million worth of renovation. It kind of differs depending on who, who you talk to and what they're kind of threshold of what a livable space is, but even though the princess has done so much renovation work, it still needs additional renovation. Uh, the Michelangelo statue, the reason we know it's Michelangelo, because when uh, Ludovico Ludovici died very suspiciously in 1633, um, his, his, uh, they did an inventory of everything that he had, and that was one of the inventories. And now he's an expert in statues. Every statue you see at uh, Palazzo Altemps came from here. As I said in the Ingresso, you see the leading Mannerist painter, Zuccheri. Now, 25 or seven years later, Caravaggio did the ceiling in the alchemy room of Cardinal Francesco de Monte. 
he was an alchemist. He's an alchemist. He, he did his alchemy work there. And he thought he could turn iron into gold, which I'm still searching for. But, but uh, nonetheless, it was beautiful. It's called Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto. And it's the three elements that uh, Cardinal Francesco da Monte used in his alchemy work. Jupiter, air, Neptune, water, and then Pluto, um, fire, the dogs of Cerebus. And so um, it, it re represents the elements, the Cronus elements that, that uh, Caravaggio used. The Caravaggio ceiling is so important just because Caravaggio was such a, is such an important artist in art history. He's one of the most famous painters in art history and there are less than 90 paintings by Caravaggio known to still exist. It's the only painting that Caravaggio ever painted on a ceiling and it was done when he was in his early 20s and still in very good favor with the Vatican and the wealthy families in Rome. Later he would end up being chased out of Rome because he killed a man in a street fight. In Guercino's painting here um, you'll see uh, the, there's a man lying on the ground and he's turning on a sprinkler system and the women that are on the lower level are getting all wet in their summer frock. And the men, their boyfriends, their husbands, are all laughing at them and pointing. This is long before all the contests in Florida, you know. And, it was, and they were making fun of all the women getting all wet. And uh, so it's such a human um, humanity that came in there uh, with, the, with the people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One thing that I think has been repeatedly stressed to me by people I've talked to for the story is how much of a turnaround uh, the princess moving into the home was and renovating it was. I mean, the house was just completely written off as ruins and um, before that she moved in, it hadn't been open to the public in years. So thanks to her restoring the house and um, digitizing the archives, hopefully, even if it sells to someone private, um, we still know more about Villa Aurora thanks to her more than we ever would have known. When I was 16, I had just graduated from high school and my parents sent my sister and I, who just graduated from college, to Rome with a kind of a teacher uh, to go all over, not just to Rome, but all over Europe. And I felt such an affinity. I can't begin to tell you. I felt like this is something I feel deeply. You can't explain it. And when I went to the uh, Trevi Fountain, I threw a coin in and I said, Oh, I hope I marry an Italian and live in Rome the rest of my life. Now, little did I know that it would be a prince or that it would take decades, you know, and, and many life transitions. Uh, but that's, that's what I wished. And uh, I, my sister and I have never forgotten it. Did dinners and tours and everything I could uh, to support my husband. And I felt, I felt it was important. And also, I felt it was such a great honor. I know it's like a drop of sand that uh, my importance uh, in this 500-year-old history is negligible, or maybe not even seen, but it was for me. And it was such a great honor to restore the 150,000 documents. It was such a great honor to greet people when they came here and tell them about the history and, and everything to try and inspire them themselves in their own lives. And uh, so it's, it's been the greatest honor of my life. And as uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius was feeling is that, you know, this was that one shining golden moment that you know you did something special in your life. And I know that. I think just being with my husband, to be with someone who loved you so much and uh, whom taught me how to love in return, it's a gift that uh, I will never forget, you know. I'd never had that before. I, I never understood what it really meant to be loved and to love in return in such a profound way. You know, it's not easy. It's not easy. My husband gave his life for this house. He did, literally. We never took a vacation. Everybody, all of our friends said, where are you going in August? And we said, no, we're staying here. And they said, but don't you want to go there? I said, no. I said, I'm so happy just being with him. Um, I think that uh, Niccolo gave me the ability to, to really be happy. And I think I'm going to be. I think I'm going to be. My future is going to be good. For the first time ever, Irish mixed martial artist Conor McGregor is the highest paid athlete in the world. Over the last 12 months, he's raked in $180 million. 
The pandemic may have sidelined athletes or forced them to play to empty seats in competitive bubbles, but McGregor and others proved 2020 was just as financially competitive as years prior. In fact, the 10 highest paid athletes in the world took home pre-tax gross earnings of $1.052 billion during the past 12 months, 28% more than last year's top earners. The combined haul falls just short of the $1.059 billion record set in 2018, the same window in which boxer Floyd Mayweather earned $285 million, almost all of it from his pay-per-view fight with McGregor. Of the $180 million McGregor earned in the last 12 months, most of it comes from the recent sale of his majority stake in whiskey brand Proper No. 12 to Proximo Spirits for $150 million. With endorsements, McGregor made $158 million outside of his fighting career. This makes him the third athlete, after Roger Federer and Tiger Woods, to earn more than $70 million off the field in a single year while still actively competing. Three other superstars also surpassed $100 million in total earnings this year. Soccer stars Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, and NFL quarterback Dak Prescott. COVID-19 did still take its toll on athletes' earnings. Soccer players at many clubs, including Messi, had their wages cut. But with many athletes making more than ever off the field, the dip is more a nuisance than a disaster. After many years of making Forbes' highest paid celebrity list, Kim Kardashian West is officially a billionaire this year. She made the Forbes billionaires list with a net worth of $1 billion. Kim Kardashian West's name first appeared in the pages of Forbes in 2011, and at the time it was just a simple tally of her Twitter followers. Five years later, she graced the cover of Forbes thanks to her booming mobile game business, which helped her earn $51 million that year. The first time she appeared on a Forbes self-made women list was in 2018 with a net worth of $350 million. Five years after gracing the cover, she's officially joining the world's billionaires list. The biggest assets in her empire are her two lucrative businesses, KKW Beauty and Skims. Kardashian West founded KKW Beauty in 2017 following the success of her half-sister Kylie Jenner's Kylie Cosmetics. She borrowed from Kylie's playbook using a similar direct-to-consumer model that relied heavily on social media marketing. Her first launch, which was 300,000 contour kits, sold out within two hours. By 2018, just a year later, her business had expanded into eyeshadows, concealers, lipsticks, and fragrances, and was bringing in about $100 million in revenue. She cashed in on her ownership of KKW Beauty last year when she sold 20% of the business to beauty conglomerate Cody for $200 million in a deal that valued the company at $1 billion. Forbes estimates that figure is a little bloated and that her remaining 72% stake is worth about $500 million. There's also Skims, the shapewear line Kardashian West launched in 2019. She raised money from fashion industry insiders like Netta Porte's Natalie Masson and Theory's Andrew Rosen and capitalized off of her massive social media following to shill the brand. The fast growing company has been quick on its feet. During the pandemic, consumers became more interested in comfy clothes for the couch than smoothing their stomachs under evening gowns and she swiftly started turning the company's focus to loungewear. It's her stake in skims that pushed her over the threshold to become a billionaire and what may cause her net worth to continue to grow in the coming years. The rest of Kardashian West's fortune sits in cash and investments, including real estate. Every year since 2012, Kardashian West has earned at least $10 million pre-tax by Forbes' count, and some years it's much more. Those paychecks come from keeping up with the Kardashians, endorsement deals, and endeavors like her mobile game or the now-defunct Kimoji app. She's also got three properties in Calabasas and a portfolio of blue chip investments, including shares of Disney, Amazon, Netflix, and Adidas that her soon-to-be ex-husband Kanye West gifted her for Christmas in 2017. As she tweeted herself the day she made the cover of Forbes, it's not bad for a girl with no talent. 27 years after the sitcom Friends debuted, its stars and creators are far from broke. The much-anticipated Friends reunion, which aired this week on HBO Max, paid Monica, Phoebe, Rachel, Chandler, Joey, and Ross up to $5 million apiece, according to a knowledgeable source. Not bad for one night's work. But that's nothing compared to what the stars have made across the sitcom for its nearly three-decade-long run. The wildly popular TV comedy generated nearly $1.4 billion in earnings since its broadcast debut in 1994. Of that, Forbes estimates the six friends received nearly $816 million pre-tax, or roughly $136 million per star. 
The creative team of David Crane, Marta Kaufman, and Kevin Bright shared pre-cash earnings of nearly $550 million. While it aired on NBC from 1994 to 2004, Friends drew in an average of 25 million nightly viewers on its own, but the money didn't pour in right away. For the first four years, Warner Bros. Television, who licensed the show to NBC, lost money on the sitcom. By the fifth season, NBC was intent on keeping Friends in its Thursday night lineup, agreeing to cover the costs of production, which over its 10-year broadcast run included an estimated $70 million in producer fees for Bright, Kaufman, and Crane, and almost $100 million for the stars, who went from making $22,500 per episode in the first season to a million dollars a show in the final two years. At that time, Aniston, Cox, and Kudrow were the highest paid actresses in Hollywood. The real payoff started when the show entered syndication to local stations, cable networks, and ultimately streaming services. Forbes estimates these deals amounted to around $4.8 billion for the production company. Creators and cast still share the rerun spoils. Forbes estimates syndication proceeds of $260 million for the cast and $475 million for Bright Kaufman Crane. So they're having the last laugh. Water is becoming an increasingly scarce resource as droughts worsen across the western United States. A scorching drought made worse by climate change is draining reservoirs at an alarming pace. Hotter, hotter temperatures and dry vegetation, the fire fight is worsening. In California's Central Valley, water prices have risen as high as $2,000 an acre foot. An acre foot is a unit of measurement that, in this case, is the amount of water it takes to cover one acre of land with one foot of water. So, one acre foot is the equivalent of about 326,000 gallons of water. As a price comparison, in non-drought times, water can sell for $250 per acre foot. On the highest end, other farmers have sold their future water rates for as high as $5,000 per acre foot. Two of the biggest players in the California water scene are Stewart and Linda Resnick. They're the billionaire owners of The Wonderful Company, known for their pistachios, mandarin oranges, and palm wonderful pomegranate juice. The Resnicks are also majority owners in the Kern Water Bank, one of California's largest underground water storage facilities. The Resnicks right now are worth eight billion dollars. Um, that's quite conservative, to be honest. It's from their farmland assets. They have a lot of different real estate, a lot of other personal assets. But this water bank is honestly pretty invaluable, and it could be one of their most valuable assets if it ever really was up for sale. A water bank is an area mostly underground where water can be stored reliably until it is needed. From above, water banks tend to look just like big puddles, but underneath, they can hold hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. The, where the Kern Water Bank is, is where the Kern River would peter out. So it is naturally an excellent uh, groundwater recharge area because over the millennia, you just, you know, it was, it was built up with sand and gravel and, you know, all that good stuff rather than clay, which is hard to, you know, percolate water through. So it's, it is naturally the best place to recharge water. I mean, it's almost incalculable to understand how valuable it is. First of all, hundreds of acres. And second of all, it is in the crosshairs of the Kern River, the Cross Valley Canal, and the California Aqueduct. So it has lots of ways to fill up. Kern Groundwater Bank continues to be, I think, the absolute jewel of banking and recharge in California, bar none. To value a water bank, we have to multiply the going rate for an acre foot of water times the full capacity of the water bank, which for a Kern Water Bank, is about 1.5 million acre feet. But prices right now during a drought are much higher. At $1,000 an acre foot, the Resnick stake would be worth about $850 million. And at $2,000 per acre foot, their stake would be worth about $1.7 billion. I've been asking around about um, prices and people are getting really kind of cagey about what, what they're A, paying for you know, water and, and B, what they're trying to sell it for because now it's getting really desperate. It's a lot of money. It's considered a public resource. You know, who's making that money? The public gets annoyed and frustrated and outraged when they start seeing you know, that kind of money going for what they consider to be a public resource. We have a lot of very impoverished communities 
uh, farm worker communities, mostly Hispanic, mostly Spanish speaking, many that have a great deal of fear of dealing with, you know, regulators of any kind because they're not necessarily here uh, with all their documentation. And so they live in these communities where it's not just contaminated water, but they can't even get water. You know, their wells are breaking or their wells were drilled to 100 feet. And now because of groundwater extraction, you know, the water table is down to 400 feet. So you have those situations that are going on. Right now, the drought is exacerbating it. This world of California water is absolutely insane on pretty much every level. Who owns it? Who moves it? How much? you can get for it, what your rights are, what your constrictions are. I mean, it's all different. It's just a huge patchwork of crazy. Billionaires who Forbes track have owned all kinds of horses over the years that we've pegged values to. But when you think of horse racing today, the Kentucky Derby, the Breeders' Cup, the Belmont Stakes, all of these races are run by one kind of horse, thoroughbreds. We're taking a look at one of America's top thoroughbred breeding farms, Spendthrift Farm. Founded by renowned horse trader and farm owner Leslie Combs II and leader purchased by the billionaire B. Wayne Hughes, the Kentucky Farm currently boasts horses like 2020 Kentucky Derby winner, Authentic. There are many different terms for thoroughbred horses, like foals, fillies, mares, weanlings, and colts. But the term you want to pay the most attention to is a stallion, which is a male horse that's often a retired racehorse. Stallions can be the most valuable assets on a horse farm, and in Spenthrift Farm's case, they happen to own one horse who is considered to be pretty much the hottest stallion in North America right now. His name is Into Mischief. In August of this year, B. Wayne Hughes died at the age of 87, but there are indications that Hughes transferred ownership of the farm to his daughter, Tammy Gustafson, and her husband, Eric. Tammy is a billionaire member of our Forbes 400 rankings, just like her dad was. Spendthrift declined to comment on the ownership transfer. To help us figure out how much these stallions are worth, we talked to several experts in the equine industry, including two who are called bloodstock agents. I describe myself as a stockbroker and a real estate agent for horses. That's Chad Schumer. He's the founder of Schumer Bloodstock Agency out of Louisville, Kentucky. Our primary focus is buying and selling thoroughbred racehorses and breeding stock. Along with that, uh, we do insurance on thoroughbreds and we do appraisals for banks. Uh, pretty much if it has to do with dollars, cents, and thoroughbreds, we do that. And that's Peter Bradley, the owner of Bradley Thoroughbreds based in Lexington, Kentucky. Stud fees can change over time depending on how a stallion's progeny do once their own racing careers start. In 2012, when Into Mischief was seven years old, his stud fee was a reported $7,500. That jumped to $20,000 the next year as some of his progeny began to win important races. Now, as a 16-year-old horse, Into Mischief's stud fee is up more than 11 times, drawing $225,000, which is the highest advertised stud fee in North America this year. To value a stallion, the general rule of thumb is to take its stud fee and multiply it by 300 or 400 times. That equation assumes the horse will book, that is, mate with, 100 mares per year over three to four years. But some stallions, like Into Mischief, book many more than that in a year, driving up revenue for the farm and increasing their own value in turn. So, to refine our methodology, bloodstock agent Chad Schumer suggested that we factor in the exact ages of each stallion on the roster and the number of mares they covered last year in 2020. I advised to not take 100% of the number because obviously all the mares aren't going to be pregnant. Some are going to die, some are going to be barren, some will not have wild foals. So I think a reasonable estimate is 80 to 85% of the number of mares bred and the cover fee. And that's the income for one year. Now, a young horse, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, he could be worth four or five years worth of income. As a horse gets older, I would, I would change that number to two or three but you're buying an asset and you're like any business you're looking for a rate of return and i think the stallions you know typically you you want to make sure a good investment in a stallion would have you out in four or five years based on this method and using the 2021 stud fee we determined that into mischief alone is worth about 135 million dollars 
and we estimated the other 2021 stallions combined are worth about $165 million. Spendthrift recently announced its 2022 stud fees and bumped Into Mischief's fee up once again to $250,000. If we include the estimated values of the other horses living on Spencer Farm, like the mares and yearlings, which we calculate separately, we estimate that all of Spencer's horses are worth about $360 million. It all sounds like it's just printing gold bars, but it's not. Peter Bradley said that roughly 10 to 30 percent of all stallions that go to stud actually make it. There's a very polarized market here for the stallions, you know, it's either chicken or feathers. The other part we have to value is the farm itself. First, we pulled parcel records from Fayette County, where Spencer Farm is located, and looked at the fair cash value of the parcels, noting the values of the land and the buildings on it. So the farm is located in Kentucky's Fayette County, so we turned to the county assessor's office in order to pull some public land records and get a sense for the value that way. The assessor prepares their own valuations of every parcel in the county and they take into account the land itself as well as any buildings that are on it. And I didn't realize this, but apparently the horses actually graze the actual grass that's on the land there. So although it's not a farm in the typical sense of it, the fact that it's producing crops, the soil agricultural quality is quite important because the horses are actually eating that grass. We looked at just one parcel. It was about 330 acres. That parcel itself was worth $5.9 million. So that included the land plus improvements and buildings on the land. Looking at all 15 parcels and adding up those values brought us to about $25 million. Fayette County updates its assessment every four years most recently on this farm in 2018, so these numbers may be a bit low. Normally to value land like this, we would look for comparable transactions, but horse farm sales in the area are rare. Spencer Farm also has another operation in Australia, which allows them to breed more horses during the Southern Hemisphere's own distinct breeding season. We estimate that the land and the horses who live there are valued at about $15 million. In total, we estimate that it's worth $400 million. Not half bad for the family farm. In a 24-minute court statement this week, Britney Spears made it clear she's done playing nice with the conservatorship that has been dominating her life since 2008. The arrangement effectively gave control of her life to her father, Jamie Spears. In her statement, Britney described a litany of suffering, from being forced to take lithium against her will to not being allowed to remove her IUD. She asked the court to have control of her life back and put an end to the conservatorship, which has allowed Jamie Spears to live off of her $60 million fortune. So how much did Jamie Spears actually pocket from Britney's earnings? Well, since February 2008, Jamie Spears has been paid at least $5 million before taxes. And since at least February 2009, a year after Jamie was named conservator in charge of her estate, he was paid $16,000 a month, according to court documents reviewed by Forbes. Over 12 years, that compensation totals $2.4 million. On top of that, Brittany has had to pay hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in legal fees for both herself and her conservators. She's also paid for her father's office space, an additional $2,000 a month in rent. A report in the New York Times also pointed to Jamie collecting portions of Brittany's touring revenue, which could explain Brittany's accusations that she was forced to work despite not wanting to or feeling sick. This includes 1.5% of the gross ticket and merchandise sales from Britney's Piece of Me Las Vegas residency between 2013 and 2017. That show brought in $137.7 million, leaving Jamie with a cut of $2.1 million. Britney did not mention the way her father invested her money or the larger picture of her finances in court, but she did speak to how her personal finances were restricted, including the fact that she can't carry her own credit card. Quote, it makes no sense whatsoever for the state of California to sit back and literally watch me with their own two eyes, make a living for so many people and pay so many people, trucks and buses on tour, on the road with me, and be told I'm not good enough, she told the court. It's been a long time since I've owned my money, and it's my wish and my dream for all of this to end. 5,500 to start, 5.5 million dollars to start it. <laughs> good start. It's 1994, and we're watching an auction in a sales room at Christie's in Manhattan. 19,500,000, next bid is 20. 20 million, 
On sale is a one-of-a-kind Leonardo da Vinci manuscript known as the Codex Hammer. 25 million. At 25 million in this room. Now, the audience in the room doesn't know this, but a representative for Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates is bidding on the phone. At $28 million, it's away from the room now and on the telephone at $28 million. Gates is up against a group from a bank in Milan that's sitting in the front of the room. On the telephone in this room at $28 million. Last call. And in the end... Thank you. The manuscript goes to Gates. Back in November 1994, Bill Gates was 39 years old and had just appeared atop our Forbes 400 ranking of the richest Americans. And Gates, who is a big lover of books, sort of goes out and gets the ultimate book, a Leonardo da Vinci manuscript that he buys for $28 million, which comes out to $30.8 million with auction closing fees. The manuscript today is known as the Codex Lester, named for the British Earl whose estate owned it for more than 250 years. It's a collection of da Vinci's writings and illustrations, mostly focused on his study of water. According to the provenance in the auction catalog, a few Italian artists owned the Codex after da Vinci's death, including a painter named Giuseppe Getzi, who apparently sold it in 1717 to Thomas Cook, a man who eventually became England's Earl of Leicester. It stayed with the Earl of Leicester's estate until 1980 when it finally went up for auction. Oil tycoon Armand Hammer bought it that year, and 14 years later, Gates bought it at another auction. It's the only one of da Vinci's notebooks that's still in private hands today. There are about 360 illustrations inside these pages, and the text is done in da Vinci's signature, what's called mirror writing, that is, he wrote backwards. One other thing to note is that the original version that Gates owns is not bound like my copy here. While at one time it was bound by another owner centuries later, that binding has since been removed, and today each page is held in plexiglass so how much is the codex worth today? So art is one of the toughest things that we have to value for our list because the value is just so subjective. Uh, it's really worth what somebody will pay for it. And you never know when a billionaire is going to just be very moved by a piece and pay uh, an amount of money that you couldn't even imagine something might have been worth uh, to get that piece. So you just really never know what something is going to go for until it hits the auction block. Books have value for their rarity, for their importance to history or literature, if it's, if it's a work of fiction, um, the first appearance of something. So once we've decided that the book is worth looking at for its condition, for its provenance, the first question we're asking, but we're going to ask it again, is what are we actually looking at? If it's a first edition of Moby Dick, um, that's a great thing to have. Then we look at the condition and we base the condition on what's in our hands and how you look at a book that's 150, 170 years old. Darren shared with us some of the important qualities that make books valuable, things like condition and rarity, but he told us that he wasn't a da Vinci or Codex expert and was hesitant to put a value on it out of the gate. So next, we decided to try talking with some experts who were more familiar with Old Masters works and da Vinci. My name is Robert Simon. I am an art dealer in New York. I work as well as an art appraiser. And my background is as an art historian. In 1993, Robert Simon was hired by the trustees of the Armand Hammer Museum to do an appraisal of the Codex Lester, back when it was known as the Codex Hammer. You may have heard of Robert Simon before because he and a colleague bought the Salvatore Mundi in 2005 for just over $1,000 in a Louisiana auction. My feeling was that the codex was quite a bit more valuable than any single drawing would be. So that was kind of the basic first principle. What by Leonardo can we compare it with? And then how do we rationalize the difference in the kind of object it is and its size? He also pulled together works of art that he found it to be similar to. Those included other drawings by da Vinci, one by Michelangelo, and one painting by another Renaissance artist named Pontormo. 
Ultimately, Simon decided that the Codex's value was $50 million in 1993. So it's difficult to get much better than someone who has already appraised the work of art that we're trying to value. But just to be safe, we also contacted some other da Vinci and rare book experts and scholars who we thought might know the work well too. Everyone spoke with the caveat that we could never really know what the Codex is worth until it actually goes up for auction. So in the end, we decided to take the average of all the recommendations we got from our expert sources. Everyone agreed, like Robert Simon said, that were it to go up for auction today, it would not draw more than the Salvatore Mundi, which sold for $450 million. A Da Vinci painting is much rarer than Da Vinci's words and sketches. He spent m much more time as a writer, a scientist, a draftsman than he did as a, as a painter. And so you've got the, the painting itself is you know much more a rare object. But no one thought it was still worth the 30.8 million Gates paid for it. We decided to take the average of every expert's opinion, which worked out to about $130 million. This means the Codex is certainly one of the world's most valuable pieces of art. But it makes up about 0.1% of Bill Gates' $134 billion fortune. According to a CNBC report, the median net worth of someone who is 65 years old, which is Gates' age, is about $266,000. So Gates buying Leonardo da Vinci's notebook is the equivalent of a typical 65-year-old splurging on a new iPad. Billionaires just live in a different world. In the sneaker world, there's the easy-to-find get them at the mall pairs Then there's the exclusives. Certain models can be worth hundreds, if not thousands, per pair depending on the brand, year, and colorway. For example, these Jordan White Cement 4s from 2012 have a going price of just over $400. This has created a niche yet powerful global market that's akin to art collecting or trading commodities. This week, the game had a big shakeup when a prominent sneaker reseller, West Coast Joe of West Coast Streetwear, revealed his identity in a Bloomberg Businessweek story. West Coast Joe is really Joe Hebert, a 19-year-old based in Portland, Oregon. And here's where things go sideways. His mother is Ann Hebert, Nike's general manager and vice president for North America. She had a career that spanned over 25 years at the sneaker giant, but because of her son, that came to a halt on March 1st, when she voluntarily resigned. A Nike spokesperson said in a statement there was no violation of company policy, sharing of privileged information, or conflict of interest, but the family connection between the two definitely raised flags. For one, it was reported Joe Hebert used his mother's credit card to buy about 2,000 pairs of sneakers for around $200,000, which he hoped would turn a profit of $50,000. One particular scoop that is now highly suspect is how he managed to find pairs of 2011 Nike Air Mags through a man who allegedly stumbled across them in an abandoned storage unit. These were reproductions of the futuristic self-lacing shoes Marty McFly wore in Back to the Future 2. Power laces, all right. Oh, and just so you know, the 2011 Air Mags are worth almost $15,000 a pair. Since the story took off, neither mother nor son has spoken publicly. In its statement about the incident, Nike also added there were no official commercial affiliations with West Coast streetwear, including the direct buying and selling of Nike products. Rihanna is officially a billionaire. Robin Rihanna Fenty was born on the beautiful island of Barbados in 1988. She grew up in a small bungalow with her two younger brothers and her parents, who had a rocky relationship. Rihanna always loved music and grew up singing along to reggae artists like Bob Marley and Buju Banton, as well as vocal powerhouses like Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, Celine Dion, and Shania Twain. From a very young age, she knew she wanted to become a star. Rihanna's big break came when she was in high school one of her friends in school introduced her to a vacationing music producer. Right in a hotel, Rihanna sang for him, forever changing the trajectory of her life. He flew her to the US, where they worked on a demo album, and went on to audition for none other than Jay-Z. Within 12 hours of that, she was signed to Def Jam. She released her debut album, Music of the Sun, in 2005.
One year later, she dropped her platinum-selling sophomore album. But her third album, Good Girl Gone Bad, shot Rihanna into major stardom, earning her her first Grammy. Dad, <laughs> I know I promised you I'm gonna give you my first Grammy, but we might have to fight for this one. From there, she released hit after hit. She was a global phenomenon, touring all over the world. Her face was everywhere, and she secured several high-profile partnerships with beauty and fashion brands, as well as successful perfume lines. But it wasn't until 2017 that she launched the brand that would take her to billionaire status, and would make her the first black woman with creative control at a major fashion house. Her makeup line, Fenty Beauty, was one of the industry's first inclusive lines, offering 40 different shades of foundation. The brand, co-owned with French luxury goods giant LVMH, was an immediate hit. In 2018, Rihanna launched Savage X Fenty, and in 2020, she launched Fenty Skin, also with LVMH. This February, her lingerie line, Savage X Fenty, raised $115 million in funding at a $1 billion valuation, Today, Forbes estimates Rihanna's net worth at $1.7 billion. And her Clara Lionel Foundation, which raises money from fans and supporters, has made donations to coronavirus relief efforts, to New York's needy, to abuse victims in Los Angeles, and more. Guy Fieri is cable TV's highest paid chef pulling in an estimated $26 million a year. Fieri was born, sans the frosted tips, in Columbus, Ohio in 1968, but was raised in Ferndale, a town in Humboldt County, California. His parents were veggie-loving hippies, managers at a Western clothing store. When Guy was 10, he got his first entrepreneurial taste of the food business. He created the awesome pretzel cart that he would take to fairs and rodeos, where hungry crowds would devour his soft pretzels. As he got older, he continued to work in the food and beverage industry, paying his dues as a dishwasher for a Mexican restaurant. He saved up enough money to become an exchange student in Chantilly, France his junior year of high school. We're guessing he consumed a healthy amount of baguettes and brie there, because he continued to follow his passion for food after graduation. He studied hospitality management at UN Las Vegas, and managed a few restaurants before finally opening his first one in 2006. Johnny Garlics in Santa Rosa, California. Hi, I'm Guy Fieri and welcome to Around the same time he opened that, he sent in an audition tape to be a contestant on the next Food Network star. Guy! And went on to win the whole thing, securing him his first show. Back then, Food Network's audience was mostly middle-aged females, and the network hoped Guy Fieri's huge personality would draw in more male viewers. Flames and Grease brought in the dudes, and when Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives premiered in 2006, Guy joined the elite club of celebrity chefs. He wasn't a snobby chef screaming at people. He was a regular guy that ate burgers and dive bars, and America ate that up. Guy was a full-on character and an instant magnet for memes. The internet went to work creating a Guy Fieri meme for almost anything, which only made him more famous. But the network could have never imagined the magnitude of the show's success. The laid-back dude had a magical draw. His fame led to Guy Fieri cookbooks, the Guy Fieri Roadshow, and Guy Fieri Salsa. Since then, he's hosted more than 14 series on Food Network, and Triple D is still on the air more than 15 years later. This is where things go off the rails right here, folks. Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives generated more than $230 million in ad revenue in just the last year. And Guy recently signed a contract with Food Network, which will pay out $80 million over three years, a $50 million raise from his prior agreement. His name is attached to 80 kitchens worldwide, and he has a delivery-only business, Flavortown Kitchen, as well as a new chain, The Chicken Guy. Not to mention Santo Tequila, which he owns with former Van Halen singer Sammy Hagar. And while he's not doing all of that, Fieri and his family make time to give back, to the community, to restaurants, to the troops, and more. All in all, Guy is a pretty big deal. You may be familiar with the family drama on HBO's Succession. 
But what would patriarch Logan Roy be worth if the hit show were a reality? I'm gonna pull you limb from limb like a pinata and see what falls out. 84-year-old Logan Roy is the founder and CEO of Waystar Royco, the fifth largest media company in the world. The Roy family patriarch was born in Dundee, Scotland in 1937, but soon left his rainy hometown for the Canadian province of Quebec, where he and his brother Ewan were raised by their aunt and uncle. Both were small-time entrepreneurs. His uncle ran a print shop and owned some advertising billboards. His aunt owned a herd of cattle. Logan followed in their entrepreneurial footsteps, starting out with buying newspapers and founding what would become Waystar Royco in his early 20s. Over time, the business expanded into theme parks, cruises, and resorts. And today, Logan Roy is worth $18 billion. The vast majority of that, $16.4 billion, coming from his 36% stake in Waystar. In all, the Roys own at least 10 properties worth $345 million. Some of the more notable ones include Logan's New York City townhouse, the Hamptons Summer Palace, the castle in England, the ranch in New Mexico, his son Kendall's five apartments, as well as that house in Malibu. Other assets include the family's luxury private jet collection, their 279-foot superyacht, and a 50% stake in the Hearts FC Scottish Soccer Club. In terms of cash assets, we conservatively estimate the Roys hold at least $1 billion. Is that it? In four years, Logan claims Waystar Royco will be the Procter & Gamble of the news. Why shouldn't we do all the news? But the company, and family's future, is extremely uncertain. There are, of course, like a ton of different college rankings. And the Forbes list, what I think really kind of makes it stand out is it's all about outcomes. So a, a lot of college lists, other ones look at relative like selectivity, how hard it is to get into a school. It's a lot of kind of soft metrics based on like relative prestige. And the Forbes list, what's different is we look at it like outputs. We look at it like an investment. Because, you know, for most people in their lives, it's one of the biggest things they'll ever spend money on. The list is kind of about finding what are the safest investments and kind of keep tweaking the methodology. Originally, we did look at some of those kind of like student experience measures, like how do students like their schools, you know, what are those kind of retention rates? And we have some of that that stayed around, but for the most part, we're looking at kind of hard outcome measures. So what's the kind of debt people are leaving with? What kind of salaries are alumni earning after the fact? What kinds of, you know, companies are they starting? Are they earning PhDs? Are they earning uh, any kind of like prestigious national award? We're looking at how quickly are people able to pay off those loans. I would say the biggest thing we did this year was that we really tried to account for how schools are treating their low-income students. To do that, we looked at a lot of data on Pell Grants, which is kind of like a way that the federal government helps make families with lower middle income able to afford college. And we looked at how schools are graduating long-term students, what kind of salaries they have after the fact, and how quickly they can pay off all the total costs of college after you take out scholarships and everything. And that's new to our methodology. So the number one this year was really exciting. It's UC Berkeley, you know, I mean, for past, I think, three years straight, and then just kind of every, you know, every other year going back further than that. The list has been dominated by Harvard at large and then kind of the Ivies. But this year, uh, a public school came out number one, and it, it was pretty cool. I mean, Berkeley obviously is like the, the crown jewel of the University of California system, incredibly elite school. But I think what really, really made it stood out for us was what's happening to low income students, low and moderate income students who go to Berkeley. because. Obviously, when you get to this top of the rankings, these are all really, really fine distinctions. But the cool thing institutionally about Berkeley is that not only do its low-income graduates do really well, but they also take on a lot of low-income students. A school like Harvard, across the board, their undergraduates, about 12% are receiving Pell Grants, those so special grants for low and moderate-income families. At Berkeley, it's 27%. And for the whole average of top 600, it's around 25. So they really, really kind of stood head and shoulders there. Um, other things we do look at, like 
we'll look at alumni of Forbes lists. So things like the 30 under 30, the Forbes 400, the most powerful women, self-made women. And Berkeley does really, really well there. To Yale was number two, Princeton number three, and they're always near the top of the list and they do really good stuff. I mean, Yale, I think really commendably did really, really great work for like graduating those Pell Grant recipient students. They produce a ton of really accomplished alumni. Uh, same thing with Princeton, cool with Princeton, uh, by far and away the lowest debt that of those top schools, uh, lowest debts coming out of Princeton. They also have like a really, really high success rate of producing PhDs, people who win academic prizes. So just really impressive stuff there. And then Stanford, where Stanford is, you know, it's number four there, but it is kind of by far and away number one when it comes to alumni pay. So alumni, if, if you went to Stanford, you're probably, you know, in for something good in terms of money. They do really well with alumni and Forbes lists. And that's a lot of people, kind of those connections to Silicon Valley and tech, they go on to start, you know, these really interesting startups and, you know, we take note of those and they end up on our lists. And that's another area where Stanford shines. Uh, Columbia all around, just like really, really solid as well. Maybe the thing that kept it out of this top four, they're a bit weaker on some of those debt measures, but just incredibly strong performer as well all around. The University of California system in general did really, really well. I mean, they had four schools in the top 25. So that was Davis, Santa Barbara, and UCLA. And they all just perform really well. The system does a lot of good for its graduates and just kind of consistently across the board does a lot for those low-income graduates. You know, these lists are really exciting when it comes to thinking about just, you know, the four-year residential college experience, kind of like the, the golden ideal of, you know, going off to college, which is just something that doesn't necessarily reflect how, honestly, a majority of college students experience higher education. You know, people are not necessarily living in residential schools. They're not there for just a clean four years. And I think that's really what we're trying to start capturing with this list is what is the actual, like what does higher education in the US actually look like right now? And, you know, there's no way that any ranking is gonna get that, but I think we're getting at it a lot better than we used to. I set the world record in February, 2019. At that time, I had 20,139 games. The passion never stopped, and uh, right now I stand around 22,840 games, roughly. Hi, my name is Antonio Romero Montero. I hold the Guinness World Record for the largest video game collection in the world. It all started when I was a young kid. My passion for video games and the amount of time and hours I spent playing, <laughs> I couldn't even start describing that. Uh, and, you know, as I got older, the passion was always there, grew, and uh, just kept simmering. When I finally started working and uh, had started the opportunity then to start buying more video games, it started with simply trying to buy some of the games that I played as a child. One of the things I love about games is actually some of the fantasy side, some of the fiction, um, some of the imagination that comes with it, the art style. You know, one way or another, that's become a part of way of how I think, how I act, and it's driven into parts of my being, in essence. So I get to share also one of the rarest PlayStation 4 games in the world. There's only 84 known copies of this game and it was for sale for a very, very limited amount of time. And uh, <laughs> definitely comes with some backstory and some uh, interesting components to how this was issued and published. But for me, one of the most hilarious part is the title and the theme of the game. Making it one of the rarest is a game called Poop Slinger. And I guess you can all imagine what the theme of the game is. This is one of the rarest PlayStation 4s in the, in the world. So this is a limited edition 
Hitman PlayStation console. There's only one manufactured in the entire world. And it was originally put up as a raffle reward, promotional item for when the Hitman game came out on PlayStation 4. And it's shaped as the suitcase of uh, the main protagonist of the game, Hitman. But it's a fully functional PlayStation system. And uh, <laughs> definitely pretty cool. So the continuation of my collection actually has nothing to do with the record. Um, I quite op openly, anybody that wants to challenge it, take the record, it's there for the taking. Okay. Really the reason I keep on my collection is just for the continued passion and enjoyment. Um, I do play quite a few games still and uh, the little spare time that I find to play. Um, but it's just an enjoyment. It's the challenge that comes with the collecting side. It's um, seeing titles that uh, you've never seen before, finding some rare stuff. Um, and nowadays I'm starting to play a little bit more with collecting items from Japan as well, which is pretty cool because you get to see how they looked in Japan versus how they look in the US and some of the art contrasts and some of the minor details, which are pretty entertaining. You know, it's been fun. That, that's the biggest part about it. It's fun. Okay? It's fun to go out and find uh, titles that you've played and say, ooh, and reminisce about those experiences. And then uh, slowly building up and achieving those collections. It's just a fulfilling component that I've enjoyed. Um, and I think, you know, in the end, every one of us carries a certain passion, a certain hobby, something that we do to enjoy ourselves. And this is what I've chosen to do. It's just uh, the experience with the games, the passion, the storytelling that comes with it, the art style, um, and all the memories that I relive every time I get to see these games, play them, and enjoy them with my family now. I always stay grounded to the fact that I gotta worry about the next video. Am I gonna make this video better than my last? I try to just keep focus on that, and that kind of keeps the bigger picture almost small for me. I'm Chris Lamberson, I'm 25 years old, and I play video games. So I started getting into gaming when I was around 16 or 17. My friends introduced me to Call of Duty. We had just went on back and forth on seeing who had a better KD, just seeing who's better at the game. And it got to a point where I became better than all my friends. And I wanted to see how good everyone else was in the world. So I started posting my content online. I did about 2,000 videos. And then Warzone I came out. That's when I started really just competing in different tournaments. I played basketball when I was younger. And so that kind of competitive drive kind of came over into gaming and that's how I kind of like love competing. So I had been doing video games for about three years while still going to school and still playing basketball, but it was never really a career at the time. So it got to a point where I was making pretty good money and I wasn't really happy going to school. So I asked my parents, I said, yo, can I take off a half a semester, really see if I can make this thing a career? And they said, okay. And they let me do a half a semester off. I focused a lot on gaming and then the rest was kind of history. Out there in the public a lot for gaming has uh, meant a lot to me as far as like, you know, pushing diversity in the space and kind of encouraging other, you know, black gamers, like this is a career path that you can chase. You don't really need a fancy computer. You don't need a lot of gadgets, a lot of expensive things. In reality, I started with, I mean, like a 50 inch TV in a garage with no air conditioning on the lowest of low quality setups. If you love gaming, if you love just creating content and overall just, like I said, being a gamer, definitely a career path. You guys ready? It all started with a marshmallow concert. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It was an interactive virtual event that took place within the popular video game, Fortnite and it was the first of its kind within the metaverse. Metaverse, the word that's been popping up everywhere recently, is a virtual community. And within that community, people can play games, work, or in this case, attend a concert. Fortnite's concert was a huge success. Nearly 11 million people live streamed the event, 
And today, that number is north of 60 million on YouTube. And that was just the beginning. A little over a year later, it was announced that rapper Travis Scott would venture into the virtual concert space. And just like Marshmallows, it was a massive success. Travis Scott's show proved how profitable these virtual concerts could be. And just like real life concerts, there's merchandise to be sold. Lots of it. In addition to the physical merch, players can also purchase skins and emotes, which are dance moves and other actions your character can perform within the game. And all that can add up. Scott reportedly grossed $20 million from his Fortnite collaboration, including merchandise sales. That's a huge number considering his entire Astro World tour from the year before grossed $53.5 million. Following Fortnite's success, other companies like Pokemon have followed suit, creating a virtual concert for its 25th anniversary with Post Malone in February. And in August, Ariana Grande hosted a virtual concert and is reportedly set to make the same amount as Travis Scott. And now, Justin Bieber is the latest pop star to announce a concert in the metaverse space, partnering with virtual entertainment company Wave. Wave's virtual concerts will be performed live, unlike Fortnite shows, and people will be able to send emotes that the performer can see in real time. It will be interesting to watch the evolution of these virtual concerts and the revenue they generate for the companies and the artists that partner with them.